Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Welcome to the Behaviorally Speaking Sustainability Series. My name is Aurélie Le Carpentier. I'm Vice President and Sustainability Practice Lead at Behaviorally. Um, we're an agency that has decades of global experience in consumer marketing insights, and we help brands achieve the most valuable moment in marketing, which is when a transaction occurs. And today I have a very special guest with me, um, Claudia Ciaretta, Insights Director at PepsiCo. And we're going to discuss the importance of sustainability when it comes to consumer research and especially when it comes to driving sustainable initiatives. So first of all, Claudia, can you please tell me a little bit more about yourself and your role? Of course, Oli, thank you so much for inviting me. This is a topic that I've learned you and I are particularly passionate about. <laughs> so yes. I'm really happy we have the opportunity to discuss. So yes, uh, my role is Global Insight Senior Director uh, at the GBS organization within PepsiCo, which means I have teams all around the world uh, doing some you know, trend, consumer understanding, behavioral understanding, et cetera, to make sure we keep track of the pulse of the culture, the people, and where we are as humanity overall. Yeah. And um, talking about PepsiCo, how how is PepsiCo as a company viewing sustainability? Can you tell me a bit more about that? Absolutely. Well, I have to confess that I didn't know everything we do until I joined the company a year and a half ago, because we don't brag a lot about it, right? But there's a huge, I mean, it's the, at the core of everything we're doing today. We have an amazing strategy called Pet Positive, and we are clear that it's the future for our company, right? So we're going through a fundamental transformation of what we do, how we do, the, how do, will we do business, operate, whatever, making sure we will do and inspire uh, positive change, mainly for the planet, for our people, for ourselves. And one thing, Oli, that was really you know, hard touching for me when I joined the company was seeing that every executive I've met so far has this very personal commitment and belief saying, you know what, if we become better as people ourselves, we will help to be to build, you know, a stronger, sustainable future for us, our families, the world. So it's been really, really inspiring for me as an individual to learn everything the company is doing on that territory. Wow, so that must be really inspiring. Um, and I was about to ask you, how have behaviors or ways of working in general at PepsiCo changed in the recent years with this? Because with sustainability, you say there is that huge pep positive program. So how is it reflected in the behaviors of the people at the company? Yeah, well, you see, the program is structured uh, in a way that we are touching, reviewing and improving the way we source ingredients, the way we make and sell our products and the way we inspire people through our brands, because there is power there too, right? Uh, so these are the three areas where we know we can you know, make a big difference. Uh, so going a bit more in depth on that, um, in the first part, that what are we doing in the way we source our crops and ingredients? Uh, we are very into the adoption of regenerative agriculture, and uh, we are we have a very strong plan to do this in around seven million acres, which is super huge, right? Uh, we have a lot of things around the improvement of water efficiency around the world. Uh, we also are very mindful and have programs to make sure we source sustainably our ingredients and also the ingredients we source from third parties, like to have this ecosystem, you know, with a sustainable mindset overall. And also everything that has to do with improving the livelihoods of all the people we work, not just the corporate guys, but agricultural communities, whatever. Uh, we're very mindful of that. Now, the second pillar I talked to you about, which is helping to build this circular inclusive value chain. Uh, there we have some numbers and very strong plans behind this. Uh, so, for example, we have already announced a very serious goal to achieve net zero emissions across our value chain by 2040. So this number, 24, is one decade earlier than what has been called in the Paris Agreement. 
Uh, so we are, you know, really going bold and strong and fast there. Um, the other very, very cool one is we aim to become a net water positive by 2030. That's just seven years from now, if you think about it, right? And it's not a lot of time when you think of all the structure and everything PepsiCo is. Uh, so these will reduce absolute water use uh, in around 11 billion liters of water per year. Also, we're planning, of course, introducing sustainable packaging into the whole value chain process. Uh, and in terms of people, we work a lot early also. Uh, so we are aiming to provide, you know, the meaningful jobs, cool opportunities for, for people, making sure we put learning there, the tools, everything you might need. We have volunteering programs, which are so cool around the world with different, you know, topics and territories. You can volunteer depending on your personal, you know, passions or interests. And uh, there's a lot of work around uh, human rights, diversity, equity, and whatever. And this takes me to the third one I was telling you about, which is how do we inspire people through our brands, right? And there we are, of course, evolving our portfolio of food and beverages to make sure each one of them, each time, it's better for the planet and for the people. So this means including diversity of ingredients in both new and existing products. And uh, this uh, means also um, expanding our footprint in nuts and seeds and, you know, these types of categories. And of course, accelerating the reduction of added sugars and sodium. Right. I, I went on because I'm passionate <laughs> about the topic, so I just kept going on and on. <laughs> I can see that. I can feel the passion. <laughs> And um, I think it's really interesting because you shared the different pillars um, of, of the brand and the different initiatives. And, um, you know, as brands in general, a really important aspect is to make sure that consumers get what you're doing right. Um, many of the biggest brands are leading sustainable initiatives. And so for PepsiCo, to what extent do you think consumers are open to it? And I'd say, what do you do at PepsiCo to ensure that people understand what you do and that consumers don't see it as some form of greenwashing, for instance? Yeah, I see what you say. So, you know, definitely one of the things I've sensed and I've seen throughout the years studying people around the world is that different people have different levels of interest and engagement with this kind of topic, even though people like you and me who are so passionate can be like what this is key there might be people who are not so so there so I, I think there's not one single response in terms of where people are towards this or as responses as as human beings in this planet um so one one thing i i want to make sure i'm clear communicating is the transparency we have as a company to bring the numbers out right so if you google if you check whatever you might find some of the numbers and things i'm sharing with you we're very transparent and serious right it's not like oh i want to be sustainable it's i'm going to achieve these this amount of water net zero emissions whatever so you can have that you can see plans when you check you know the shareholders reviews and whatever that's out there um, nevertheless, we don't push too hard uh, for uh, people or who like to buy our products to be, you know, aware or whatever, because we do this because it's the right thing to do. We're not doing it because I want you, oh, buy my potatoes because I'm having, you know, I'm saving water. That's that's not it, right? Um, so we, if somebody's interested and Googles or checks us on that, they will have all the information transparent and available and with you know delivering results and advances every quarter and whatever so it's a very serious company thing uh, we're not just pushing that so much there and you know part of what's behind this is you might sense by now that we are a very human-centric company uh, so for us it's very important that uh, we understand where people are and people are also finding sometimes difficult to understand who's who, you know, what's the right ingredient. What's... So that's our challenge. And that's something we're definitely taking on and saying, how can we make you having more healthy and positive choices for yourself easier? 
Um, mm. But as something we are trying to do, like uh, to communicate and if possible, educate us all better as, as human beings, um, not trying to do advertising and marketing about it because it's it's not what's at the heart of this initiative. Yeah, and I guess it's a step by step process anyway. I mean, we see there are lots of different phases to to reach your goals. Um, and I want to go back to you a little bit, uh, Claudia, uh, and talk to, um, about your role a little bit more. So specifically for you, for your role, what does sustainability mean? Uh, and, you know, what kind of implications does it have on your role? Um, yeah, what does it mean to you? Oh, I mean, you're touching like my life purpose. <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's a big thing for me. Uh, and I'm so happy that I, in, in complete honesty, have the space to do it uh, here. So in my role, um, I make super sure we have a better workplace, right? That with the people I have at first hand, I want to make super sure we're diverse. Uh, we have, you know, inclusion. We are a good space, a safe space where you can work and everything. And I also want to make sure everybody around me is so aware of this of PEP positive, the sustainability thing, because you know, Oily, it is what we do as individuals that will take us where we need with the planet, mm. right? Uh, so I do it more in a human to human, person to person perspective, because that's something I personally control just by myself, right? Besides collaborating with volunteering and things, that's something I have very close. Um, now, what has been really cool is that my team being inside professionals, you know the profile. I mean, I might have mathematicians, but I also have psychologists, anthropologists, you know, the diversity is huge and we all have this at our core. So we do a lot of volunteering, even for insights, work related things, right? So probably in the top of everybody's job, sometimes we might have just an idea spark session and we might be like, you know, might people be worried about this thing about global climate change or whatever what are they saying and sometimes it's not a formal project which is volunteer and do it and bring it because we want to make sure we drive the conversation and we keep the whole company connected to what's like the pulse uh, you know around the world on these kind of topics that's like the cool thing we do on the top of everything <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Um, thanks so much for sharing this uh, with me, Claudia. And um, to go back to, to PepsiCo uh, a little bit and to insights, um, tell me a bit more about what's the future of sustainability at PepsiCo and how can insights help with that? Yeah, well, the future, I, I, I think I briefly described. Yeah, we are totally there in net zero emissions, water supply, positive agriculture and all of that. So that's where we see um, each other. Now, insights in particular, I think our key role, I mean, from human insights, right? Because insights is a word too broad sometimes and you can have insights in different territories. But talking about human insights, I think our key role is be building this bridge of communication. How can we, from the power of our brands and our company, educate ourselves better on what's good for you, what which are the wise choices, what's the level of you know intakes of A, B, or C that it's healthy and good for you and whatever. And how to do that is a huge challenge because you know, learning process, it's a huge topic per se. Some people are more auditive, some more visual, some more kinesthetic. As we were saying before, some people are more interested in the topic and some are less, uh, right? Some people might go like, I love my um, uh, product the way I had it all the time. I don't want it to be in any way different. And uh, that might or not be a, a, a space we want to pursue. So understanding all that kind of nuances, I think it's a lot of art. Um, into the science of, of research that we need to put to drive the conversations to the business. Because after all, we are the translators. We are the voice of the people in the company saying, guys, we need to do this. We need to improve that. And it's a, such a privilege to be in such a role, to be honest. Amazing. <laughs> and um, 
I, I was wondering if you had like some more specific examples or success stories or any lessons um, that you learned that will highlight the, the importance of consumer research on sustainability. Yeah, I mean, I do. I do have my, and actually now that you pop out this question, I'm like, oh my God, we can, where to choose? Because as you can mm. imagine, a lot of people around the world resonate so much with that, that we have different initiatives in different places. Um, probably what I want to share today is one that uh, was born in LATAM and now has been exported worldwide. And me being Mexican, I'm particularly proud of this one. Uh, but we have many different examples around the world. So this one uh, happened in our Andean region in Latin America. So we have um, the environmental sustainability area within the company working, you know, as I was telling you, with very structured programs around this topic around the world. So these guys their ways that were saying, OK, there's an opportunity water wise, right, to understand how can we um, spend or save water when we wash our potatoes for our margarita uh, lace-ish uh, product we have down there, right? Uh, so these guys began to think about it and we were, this was one of those things, Aurelie, that was not based on uh, consumers or humans saying, I want you to save water because that's something you, as a consumer, really don't say. This is one of the things that we just wanted to do because it's the right thing, right? To save water, I mean, right? So yeah. um, what they did was, you know, engineers and the chemists and I don't know, a bunch of people there saying, okay, how do we do to wash potatoes with this amount of water? And they drove it to half of the water we were using. So at this point in time, you know, it was very nice because instead of uh, spending two liters per X amount of potatoes, we would spend one. Very happy news, but that's still not net zero, right? Uh, so it's a great saving, but we're not there. Uh, so the engineers down there, honestly, they were just inspired one day, you know, wandering around the plant and everything. And they came like, oh, but there's a lot of rain in this region. What can we do with the rain? Okay, so they did, you know, some uh, uh, wheels and whatever around the plant just to capture the rainwater, process it uh, to the highest drinkable international standards there are in the world with, you know, the World Health Organization and everything, and then use that water uh, to keep uh, cleaning and washing our potatoes. And that took us to an almost net zero um and water usage uh, for the country so what we had last year 2022 we totaled 260 days without using any water uh from you know the the pure water they we get from the government or whatever just the rain waters and cleaning and whatever which was amazing i got chills telling you <laughs> which was amazing and then that initiative was just exported to mexico to brazil and now we have some countries in amisa in apac in other regions of the world going like okay let's use some of the rain we have in this beautiful planet to do these kind of things and be more mindful about the water uh, so just to close on this example is one I, I love because of many reasons, but uh, it is also an example of one of the great things we've done, that it's not tied to what a consumer might tell you. We are not making big advertising about it because it's not the, the point. We're just doing it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, and I think it's so important to remember that, to remember that we're inside professionals and we care about what consumers say or do very often but sometimes it's not just about that we have to go beyond that so that's a yeah. such a great example thanks for for sharing it and I can I can feel the passion again when you're sharing this and it's so great as well to see that you've you know implemented this in other countries so yeah it's amazing example cool. thank you thank you i mean i'm sure you you you're very close to this kind of bridges we build from insights right so you know we all care about water and the planet and whatever but as a as a consumer you don't get to wash your mm -hmm. potatoes with less water right so that's yeah. the point where we do this kind of uh, curation sort of saying okay 
Well, such a great example. And um, I mean, I'm sure we could talk about this for for hours. <laughs> But um, so I think we're reaching the end of, of this interview. Claudia, I wanted to say thank you so much for, for sharing all of this, for your time. Um, for me, these were really important insights today. It was great to discuss why consumer research is so crucial to make informed decisions, to develop effective sustainability initiatives and strategies. Um, make sure to check out our website, uh, our Behaviorally Speaking episodes on Behaviorally.com and contact us at info at Behaviorally.com if you have any questions on how we can support brands testing the success of their sustainability initiatives for packaging or for path to purchase. Thanks again. It's been amazing, Oily. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.